So we're recording now. And I just wanted you guys to know, good morning, Julian and Nathan. Um, so I wanted you guys to be aware that I, I am aware <laughs> that not everyone was able to finish everything in the orientation module because of all the kinks that are happening with engaged stuff, okay? So I, I don't know if I mentioned it last class, but I do not intend to smart drop anyone in this class. You guys have been attending classes. You've been asking questions. Um, you're here, okay? And that's really the purpose of all of that smart drop stuff is just so that people are not like lazily, you know, getting to their classes eventually. They, you want the people to start off, you know, on the right foot and get going. And I feel like all of you guys are making an attempt to do that. So I have no intention um, on dropping anybody in this particular course for that reason, okay? Um, and they, if there may be one or two people in the class from the online version of this same course, um, the CoREC, and I think I only had like one or two students that had not ever even logged into Canvas ever. And so I did have to drop those two students because that is obviously not making an effort to begin the course, right? Um, so that's different. You know, you guys have, are in a face-to-face. -face. You have been coming into our um, Zoom meetings. You have been meeting with me. A lot of you have done a lot of the orientation module. Um, we just haven't gotten quite all of it because of all the Cengage problems, okay? Um, and then I also noticed that there's like one or two people that are having some trouble with the lockdown browser. And I want you guys, again, this is not a requirement for our face-to-face -face classes. It is a requirement for the online classes um, because the online classes will be taking their tests purely online. And so for them, they have to have a lockdown browser. And so I need them to have time to get with the IT department and make sure that they get their lockdown browser uh, up and running as soon as possible. For us, we have a little bit more wiggle room to get through that. Um, hopefully we don't need it. Hopefully we can go back to face-to-face um, -face classes before then. And um, we won't need to use that function, but I don't think that that's gonna happen. Well, I know it's not gonna happen for at least the first test because our first test is supposed to be this Monday coming up. And it's just gonna be over three sections. The section we talked about last class, which was multiplying. And then the section that we're gonna talk about today. And then the section we talk about tomorrow. So it's really only three sections and they're not too, too hard. They're not too complicated. And especially if you've done factoring before, these ones won't be that difficult, okay? Um, we'll get into some more stuff later. If you have never factored a polynomial before, if that's completely brand new to you, then it may be a little bit more difficult, this um, unit, okay? Um, but we're just gonna try to, I want us all to be on the same page and I'm gonna go through it. Like I said, if you already know this stuff, it's gonna be kind of boring for you, <laughs> but um, I need to make sure that we're all on the same page as we keep moving forward, okay? Um, but we do want to get the stuff inside the orientation done. I am going to extend the deadline until Thursday. I haven't gone in there and done it yet because it takes some time. And this morning when I came in um, at 7.30, I really needed to respond to a whole bunch of emails that I got last night um, from folks that were trying to get through the orientation that were either getting stuck somewhere or um, they ran out of time. So I responded to all of those emails this morning and then I will go in and change the dates. Um, not right at 10 o'clock because this class ends at like 9.45. Then I have a meeting with the Cengage people at 10. And I think that that is a priority um, over changing these dates for the moment, just because we're supposed to discuss how they're gonna fix um, those links. I need those to be fixed. Um, Cause even the folks that have gone through all of the orientation, you're still kind of stuck. You can't work on the homework section that we talked about last class. You can't get into your web assign, you know, nothing. So let me talk with them at 10 o'clock. And as soon as I'm done with that meeting with the Cengage people, um, I'll come into Canvas and I will change all the dates for the orientation. So for those that did not get to finish it 
um, you'll still have a little bit of time to get through it and get it done. It does need to be done for the face-to-face -face classes and the online classes, um, because I need you to have practice with that lockdown browser, you know, taking a quiz using a lockdown browser, and then have practice uploading your paperwork, okay? So that we're all ready to do that same process on Monday, okay, for the test. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this again, just because, well, first, does anybody have any questions over any of that? I hope I'm being clear. I'm just trying to be a little flexible. I know for the most part, all of us are making an attempt. So I don't want anybody to get scared to think that they're um, going to be dropped because I'm not dropping anybody from this class. And on the online class, there was only two and they're already gone. So nobody else should be leaving me. Um, unless it's by choice, and I hope not. Okay, so we already, I think we were on page 13, the last class. So we already covered P.3, and today we're going to cover um, P.4. So this is all remedial stuff. Normally the P sections are going to be the remedial um, material, and then there's a few like chapter one sections that are some of the remedial material. So um, for this section, we're going to be covering factoring. And so that's a big one. Now for this class, because um, we do continue P.4 next class, okay? But for this class, we're going to concentrate on just factoring common factors. Um, we're going to concentrate on special polynomial forms. Um, and then we're going to eventually start talking about grouping and we may even get to the trinomial. So for them, it's a lot of factoring today, okay? So I'm hoping you guys have seen some of it. If not, it's okay. We're gonna go work on this together, okay? Um, somebody said, oh, for this class, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for this class, we are still doing, what is considered um, beginning algebra, okay? We haven't quite gotten into the what quote unquote intermediate algebra, which is what your 314 class is supposed to be covering, okay? But right now we're at the very, very beginning of it. And I wanna make sure that we're all good with basic algebra before we go into the intermediate algebra, okay? Um, intermediate algebra usually consists of um, solving equations and, and graphing. And when we get to solving equations that we, we should already know how to factor, okay? So this section, this unit A is really like part one. It's, it's really the beginning algebra. It's ha we're not even in the intermediate algebra yet. So it's like the very, very beginning, okay? So one thing that I wanna talk about is what factoring is. And it's essentially backwards or the opposite of multiplying. It's kind of like, <laughs> it sounds funny, but in the previous problems, we were doing these guys, right? And we were multiplying it all out and then we were combining our like terms, right? And then when we were done, we had this long polynomial. Now, factoring is going backwards. So it, you're going to start with a long polynomial, and then you have to figure out what were the two polynomials that they multiplied together to get that long polynomial, okay? So it's essentially working backwards from the multiplication. It's If I give you the number 12 and I ask you what are the factors of 12, you're essentially telling me what are the two numbers that you would have multiplied together to give me that 12, okay? Okay. Um, and when it comes to numbers, we have options sometimes, right? The, for example, the number 12 itself. I could have multiplied one times 12. I could have multiplied two times six. I could have multiplied three times four. Any one of those pairs would have given me that same answer, okay? 
With factoring polynomials though, usually your factors are going to be the same, okay? And especially if you do what's called factor completely, I might say that with quotes, factor completely, um, because, give me one second, I just realized I do not have, uh, da, 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 da. I was trying to make sure if I had my um, annotations turned on, but I think I do. Okay, so, um, Sometimes we're, we're, when we factor polynomials, we're usually only going to have one answer and one answer only, okay? But I do want to point out something, and I'm going to actually share my um, camera with you. So let me do stop share, and let me go to my IPVO. Make sure you pin um, my screen, okay? So make sure you pin, I have to pin it as well. So click on my little video, you'll see the little three dots, and then click pin, and it should pop up my paper and my calculator real big that you can see it real good, okay? So we're doing P.4, which is factoring. Um, and what I wanted to point out is if you write a product like this, so those are your two factors, and they give you 12. I want you to be aware that the order in which the factors stand does not matter. The product is still the same, 12, right? So for instance, I'm just gonna give you the answer here, but if I had two things like this, again, I'm just giving you the answer, right? It doesn't matter what order the two factors are in, these are the same thing, okay? So whether you gave me your answer like this or whether you gave me your answer like that at the bottom, those are the same answer, okay? So there's only one correct factorization for a polynomial and even though it might look different, okay? So I just wanted to point that out because some people don't realize that this is the exact same thing as that, okay? Um, the properties behind that mathematically um, is the, com what is it? Commutative property. I get mixed up in words, <laughs> but it's the commutative property. Commutative property means it doesn't matter the order in which I multiply, I'll still get the same result. okay? And that property also is true for addition, right? If I add two people together or swap them over and I add them together, the result is still the same. It's not the true for division, right? If I have a fraction, which is division, right? If I have this, that's three. That's different from this, which is one third, okay? So you don't have a commutative property for um, sub subtraction or for um, division. It only happens for multiplication and for, um, addition. Okay, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. Now, what happens if we are asked to factor the polynomial, but it cannot be factored? Like we do all the process and everything correctly, but it just does not factor correctly. I try to factor it, I multiply it out to check my answer, and it doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't um, give me what I originally started with. Those things are called prime polynomials. Okay, so you can have a polynomial that just does not factor. And in that case, it would be called prime. So that's good to keep in mind because if you are working on the homework and it says factor if possible, and you're trying and trying and trying and you can't get it, um, chances are you have to actually type in the word prime, okay? So just keep that in mind that sometimes, no matter what we're doing, you can't factor it. And so the answer is just prime. Okay, so here are some examples of what it looks like when you factor something. So they're saying that when you have x squared minus three, it can be factored into this format here. Um, and you can double check it. You can FOIL, I mean, you can FOIL because it is two 
it is a binomial times a binomial. Um, let me show you my annotations here. So you have one binomial there and you have one binomial here, right? Um, so you can FOIL it. Or you can just do the distributive property, which does X times X, X times this guy, this times this guy, and then this times this guy, okay? It's essentially the same as FOIL. But when you do that and you combine all your like terms, you do end up with this expression, okay? This is gonna come in handy, this breakdown, when you get to like pre-count calculus. So keep this in mind, okay? Um, here we have one that is, got four terms. So notice this is a, I'm just gonna say polynomial with four terms. And if I were to FOIL this two things out, I wouldn't be able to combine any of my like terms because X times X squared is X cubed. X times positive four is positive four X. Negative one times X squared is this negative X squared. And then negative one times positive four is this negative four, okay? So in none of them are like terms, so we wouldn't be able to combine them, but it's just further proving that that is a true factorization of that polynomial, okay? Um, now, what they want you to notice is that if you change the signs here, notice how here it was a plus and now it's a negative in red down here. And this one is a minus, but now it's a positive down here. Notice that the factorization changed as well, okay? So those signs do matter and they are going to affect how you factor the polynomial. And now they're telling you also notice that this expression here, the factored expression, right? I factored it. So if the problem said to factor it, I'm done, I factored it. However, that is not considered factored completely because this guy here, x squared minus four, can actually factor further into x plus two and x minus two. And you could double check it, you could FOIL this out, right? Combine your like terms, and you'll notice that you get x squared minus four, okay? So just making that note that yes, you can factor, but sometimes you might not be done. You have to continue and make sure that it is completely factored or factored completely. Okay, so let me put on my mouse so I can scroll. So this page is talking about the first type of factoring that we're gonna learn, okay? And the first type of factoring is just factoring out a common factor. It's essentially the reverse of the distributive property, okay? So you're gonna start off with two terms, two terms here, and you're gonna notice that both of those terms can be divided by something, the same. And once you figure out what that thing is, you're going to put it outside the parentheses. Then once you decide what factor they both have in common, what they can be divided by, you're going to actually divide it there. Now, forgive me, I'm using this little mouse. I'm trying my best. <laughs> and so then if I were to divide this term by that common factor, you'll notice that the common factors A would cancel, leaving me with this B here all by itself. This common factor would cancel here, leaving me with the C here all by itself, okay? And so you're essentially reversing the distributive property, okay? And so we're gonna practice some problems like that um, on undoing the distributive property, right? Factoring out that common factor. Okay, so let me go back to my mouse and I will go to the first example. So they're giving me the solutions here. So for the example, it says factor this expression. And so what you would do is you would look at that expression and decide for yourself, what could it be divided by? What could each term be divided by? Okay. Um, 
And when you're looking at that, I noticed that six and four are both even numbers and all even numbers can be divided by two, okay? So I know for a fact that both of those numbers can be divided by two. I would ask myself the question, can they be divided by anything more than two? And the answer is no, six and four cannot be divided by anything more than two. I can divide six by three, but I can't divide four by three evenly. And I can divide four by four, but I cannot divide six by four evenly. So two is all I've got. But you'll also notice that they have an X in common, okay? And so if that's, if that's a variable that they have in common, you can factor that out as well, okay? Um, now they do it like this and they rewrite it like that. I'm gonna write this guy on paper just so that you can see um, how I work it when I'm doing it on paper. And if you're ever trying to decide how many X's should you be taking out? Should I be taking out the X? Should I be taking out the X cubed? Should I be taking out an X squared? What should I be factoring out, okay? Always go with the lower exponent on X. And so here I have an exponent of um, three. Here's the X with no exponent. Does anybody remember what the exponent is when it does not show an exponent? You can come off of mute and just shout it out. One. You got it. Good. Okay, so then between three and one, one is gonna be my lowest, right? And so that's why you'll notice that they factor out a two for the number part and an X to the one for the variable part, okay? So let me, um, yes, somebody answered it in the chat. You are correct. Let me go back to my paper. I know it takes a little bit of time, but I apologize. Just trying to make the most that we can with this uh, technology. So I have the problem here and I really wish this thing would focus a little bit better. Maybe if I get closer, well, that looks better. Okay, so I'm working on this problem here and I noticed that both of those could be divided by two. And then as far as the variables, they both have X's. So I can take out X's, but how many? We have to go with the lower exponent, which means I would be taking out just X to the one or just X. Now, how do I figure out what's gonna go in the parentheses? This is how I do it. I take exactly what was there and I just divide both of them by what's outside, okay? And so then this on the outside is gonna stay there, but then six divided by two is three and X cubed divided by X, I don't know if you know that, but um, when you have bases that are the same and you have division, you actually subtract the exponents, okay? So for these variables here, they have both the same base because the bases are both X's, I need to subtract those exponents. So then I'm gonna end up with X squared. And here four divided by two is two. For the variables, they actually cancel each other out. But if you think about it, it's X to the one minus one, right? Which is zero, meaning there's no more X's, okay? So then you would close that parentheses. So whether you're using the exponent rule or you're just using division rule, anything divided by itself is gonna cancel out and give you one, right? Two times one is still two. So let's see, I think that looks exactly like what they had. Yeah, so we're good there. Okay, now for the next one, it's the same thing, but there is a trick to that one. And I will explain it. When these things are in descending order, okay? When your polynomial is already in its standard form, the powers decrease. Here the power is two, here the power is one, here there's none, right? No X's at all. So it's already in standard form. When it's in standard form, if the front guy is negative, 
you have to factor out that negative. You do not have a choice, okay? So I know for a fact that just because the front term is negative, I'm going to have to factor out a negative. Then I would look at all the numbers and decide, can all of those numbers be divided by a common factor? And two is gonna be my guy again. So I know that every single one of these people can be divided by two. I can divide these two by three, um, or these two by three, and I can divide these two by four, but I have to be able to divide all of them by the same number. And so that number is going to be two in this case. Now, anyone feel free to come off of mute, or you can type it in the chat, but can I factor out any variables? Can I factor out any X's in this problem? No. Correct. Do you know why? Because negative six doesn't have a, a variable. Right. And when we're doing common, right, quote unquote common, these all three people, all three terms should have this guy in common, right? And since he doesn't have one, he doesn't have any X's in common. Good. So I'm done. All I can take out is a negative two. But then how do I figure out what goes in here? This is what I'm doing in my head. And I'm going to do it on paper for a few times. After that, I'm going to stop doing this process on paper. And this is only going to be done in my head. That's where you want to get. OK, so negative 2. And then this becomes positive 2. A positive and a negative becomes negative. 12 divided by 2 is 6. And then negative divided by negative is positive. 6 divided by 2 is 3. And you can check your answers. That's what's cool about factoring is that up here, grab another color. Up here, if I distribute this, the question is, does this equal the original, right? And it does. 2x times 3x squared is 6x cubed. 2x times negative 2 is negative 4x. I can do the same thing down here. I can distribute that negative two and see, does it equal this up there, okay? If it does, then you have factored it correctly. If it doesn't, you probably have an error somewhere in your factoring, or it could even be possible that your error is in your um, multiplication. So you definitely wanna double check everything if it's not coming out the same, okay? So that's just like another way to check your Yes, that is the way to check your work. Yep. You can check it before you even click the buttons for WebAssign to check it whenever we get into WebAssign. <laughs> but yes. So you never have to wonder on the test, do I have the right answer? Do I? You'll know if you have the right answer. Okay. Granted, you're multiplying correctly, right? But you should know whether or not you have the right answer. You never have to ask me, hey, miss, is this right? I don't know. Is it? you should be able to determine that, okay? So that's nice about this section. Not all the sections are gonna be nice like that, okay? Not all of them, um, you can actually check yourself. So let me write down um, C, and then we'll talk about that one in a minute. So this one's gonna look really ugly. I know they make it look all nice and neat, one step, bam, done, right? Um, <laughs> it's not that nice. So let me go over to my video. So here you want to find out what they have in common. Now, remember, we're talking about what are called factors. So you want to find something that is already being multiplied in there that I could divide out. Okay. And if you notice, you have this whole quantity here, X minus two, that is multiplied because of the parentheses, it's multiplied by this guy. And the same with this one, you have another X minus two that's multiplied by this guy three. So you can take out the common factor and that common factor is X minus two. Now here's a shortcut on doing that part in my brain. Sometimes instead of rewriting it here, I just put what I'm going to factor out on the, in the outside 
And then I go over here and I scribble it in down here. So that I'm not rewriting everything again. And then you'll notice this factor is gonna cancel with that factor. This factor is gonna cancel with that factor. And so what would I have left here? I would just have the 2x all by itself. I'd have this plus sign, and then I'd have that three all by itself, okay? So this part in red is really the stuff that's going on in your brain. But if you're the kind that likes to scribble it down, go for it, okay? That also helps me to determine how you're doing things, which is great. That's perfect for what I want on like test paper, okay? But if you were to go from here straight to here, I can understand what's going on in your mind, okay? I get that. Um, we will eventually get to problems that, you know, we can only do so much in your mind. After that, you got to write some stuff down. Um, but right now, some of this stuff can be done in your head, okay? And if you are one of those that does it in your head, and that is okay. Now, we do have some... Um, special kind of factorization um, formulas or forms. So one of those is, is if you are trying to factor a difference of two perfectly squared numbers, we already know, you know, the big guys that were working on math long, long, long time ago, already figured out that it will factor into um, this and this. So basically, whatever was being squared here, the base, will go in the front of the parentheses. And whatever was being squared in behind the minus will go in the back. And one of the factors will have a plus, and one of them will have a minus. Remember, this is the same thing as u minus v and u plus v. Remember that commutative property for multiplication. It doesn't matter whether you put this factor in the front or whether you put it in the back. It's the same product, okay? It will give you the same result after you multiply and combine your like terms, okay? So I don't want you to think that the front factor always has to have a plus and the one in the back has to always be a minus. You can put the minus in the front and then the plus in the back. It makes no difference. Just so long as one factor has a plus and one factor has a minus, okay? Um, some other ones that we notice are these, if you have the forms like this, these are a little bit harder to recognize. Some people do, like they see x squared and then they notice nine is three squared. And then they notice, oh, well, if I take x and I take three and I multiply those together, I would have three x. But then if I multiply that by two, I get six x, okay? And so they kind of broke it down to match this form over here on the left-hand side. And then the big math people said, oh, that's gonna factor into this. And so notice they just took the X that was in the front being squared and put it here. They took the three that was being squared in the back and put it here. And then they put a big square on the outside. Now, again, remember what a square means. It means X plus three times another X plus three. And if you actually FOIL that out and combine your like terms, you will notice that you'll get the polynomial that they started with, okay? Me personally, I do not remember these three formulas. I mean, yes, they're in the back of my mind now because I've been doing this for like whatever, 20 years, right? So I know these formulas are there and they're in the back of my mind, but honestly, I have never used them. Um, I know that they exist. I know how to use them. I know when to apply them, all of that good stuff. I just don't ever use them. Um, because eventually when we start learning how to factor all trinomials, no matter what they look like, there's a method to it. And that method actually works for everything. And you'll get these same answers using that other method. And I am a firm believer of show me the one way that works for everything instead of showing me 10 million ways and 10 million ways I could do it. I don't want to get confused with trying to employ this method and that method and that method 
And then I get everything wrong because I mixed them all up, right? You run that risk with the more methods that you learn. So when I teach factoring trinomials, we, you have three terms, okay? We don't care about the signs here. That's, that's not important. Any trinomial, okay? As long as there's three terms, there is a method to factor it, okay? Um, and what I like about the one method that I'm gonna show you is that if it doesn't work, then you know that that puppy is prime. You don't have to second guess or think, oh, well, can I apply one of those special um, forms? Can I do you know, anything special with it? No, you can't. If the method doesn't work, then it doesn't work, okay? Just so you're aware, that method is called the AC method, okay? So you may have heard that phrase before. Some of you may not have liked that method before, but that will be the one that I use to factor almost always, okay? The only time I don't ever use it is when I have a binomial that looks just like this, I will use this formula, okay? But other than this one formula, everything else, I will, all the trinomials, I will factor the same way, okay? And all that happens when you factor it, the other method is you will get U plus V, and then you'll get another U plus V. And guess what? Those are exactly the same, aren't they? Isn't the square, doesn't the square mean this on the right-hand side? So you will get the same answer, okay? And it will look like this, but then you can always rewrite it to look like that if you wanna be fancy, right? Um, so we'll get to that method when we get to the trinomials. Right now, we're not gonna talk about it because we're not at trinomials yet. We still gotta talk about some more special polynomials. So the next special polynomials are going to be the cubes. So we already know what happens when we have a difference of squares, when these two guys are squared, right? And there's a minus in the middle. But now we're talking about what happens when they're perfect cubes, okay? And so when they're perfect cubes, they do factor into these forms, okay? Now, I will work one out. I'm sure there's gonna be one in the examples in a little bit, but um, you do have to identify what is being cubed. For the variables, it's usually pretty straightforward. I mean, obvious, excuse me, obviously it's X that's being cubed. For the numbers, you have to actually figure it out, okay? So here, notice that this one is not just an X that's being cubed, okay? So for there, um, it does have a number. So I have to figure out what is that number that's being cubed. And it turns out that it's three because three times three times three equals 27, okay? So it turns out that what is being squared there in the front is actually three X. And then the only thing that gives me one is one. So it has to be one cubed that will give me one. And so notice for this first parentheses, it's just whatever the base is here and whatever the base is there, those go here and here. So I have this in the parentheses, that's gonna go there. I have this in the parentheses, that's gonna go there. Now for the other side, this guy is always gonna be plus no matter what. You can have these formulas on your note sheet, but, or I will put them, you don't get a note sheet in this class. Um, but I will put them on a note sheet in the test itself. I don't know if everyone has taken the um, readiness quiz, but if you noticed in the readiness quiz, I did have these formulas, okay? And that's what I mean by, I will put the formulas on the test itself. So if you scroll all the way up to the top of the test, you'll see all the formulas that I've given you for each test that we take. You will have formulas there for you. Okay, anything that's not there is because you're expected to know that, okay? And I can share with you what is gonna be on that note sheet whenever we do the reviews, okay? So if anyone asks well, what, what kind of notes are gonna be on this test, I can show you, okay? Um, okay, so let's see. Now, how do I get the next sign? Whatever was in the beginning, the front, 
that's always going to be what's here in the first parentheses. And then the opposite is always going to be there. So notice the patterns, right? Whatever was here in the middle is what is in this first parentheses. So notice there it's a minus. So here it's a minus. Then the next one is the opposite. Notice how the next one is the opposite. But for both of them, the back guy is always plus. So if you want to get in a habit of starting to memorize formulas just because it's faster, instead of having to go like flip through all the pages and find the formulas that waste time, um, you can memorize them and it's not so, so hard to, to memorize. But you can and will have a little bit of a crutch when it comes to the tests because I will have the formulas in there. Okay, but then how do I get the numbers? That's great, fantastic, I got the rhythm of the signs. How do I get the numbers? This first number is going to be whatever you had in here. It's going to be that thing times itself. And so what is 3x times 3x? That is 9x squared. Then the next term is going to be what you had in the front times what you had in the back. So 3x times 1, which is where the 3x came from. And then what goes at the very end? It's going to be the 1 times the 1, which is still 1. Okay. Same goes for the top one. The front number is x. So this is x times x. The back number is 2. So this is x times 2, which is 2x. And then the back guy is 2 times 2. So I'm hoping you see the pattern there, right? So it's one guy squared in the front, one guy squared in the back, and the two guys multiplied together in the middle. So let's go ahead and try to um, apply these formulas. This one's just going over the difference of squares a little bit more, okay? And remember I used that word the last class period, conjugate. It's when the guys in the front are the same, the guys in the back are the same. The only thing that's different is the signs in the middle. Those are called conjugates, okay? So they're just kind of going over that word. I had already mentioned it, but now you're formally seeing it. So they work out these problems and notice that you have this guy, oops, you have x plus two, that whole thing is being squared. And here the y is being squared. So I can use the difference of two squares. And when I do that, I'm basically gonna get the front guy, x plus two and x plus two, the back guy, y and y, and then one of them is gonna have a plus and one of them is gonna have a minus. It does not matter if you put the minus in the front bracket and the plus in the back bracket, it's the same answer, okay? And so all they did was go, oh, look, there's nothing to multiply in the front. There's no exponent here to, to, you know, to square or cube anything. So then I don't need these parentheses anymore. It's just gonna be X plus two. Same goes here. There's no exponent here to apply. There's no coefficient here to distribute. So it's just X plus two without parentheses. And then you bring down the plus Y and the minus Y. Now, just remember that that is the exact same thing if you had done them backwards, it's okay. These are both correct answers. Okay, so both of those would be correct. Now over here, it's a little bit more difficult because it's not obvious what's being squared like in part A. So here you actually have to think about it. Like what multiplies to give me 16 to where it's the same number times itself. What multiplies to give me 81, where it's the same number times itself? It turns out that that number happens to be four, because four times four is 16. And here it happens to be nine, because nine times nine is 81. But you also have the variables to consider. So what would my exponent have to be here so that when I square it, I end up with that x to the fourth power, okay? 
<coughs> and so you have to remember your rules. When you have an exponent here inside parentheses, you have to remember that those exponents actually get multiplied. I'm trying to make this clear, okay? But they get multiplied together. So then two times what is gonna give me that four that I'm looking for? It's going to be two times two that gives me the four that I'm looking for, okay? So that's why they have a 4x squared in this parentheses here. Let me undo that right there, okay? So that is what's being squared to give me 16x to the fourth. And then the back one's a little bit easier. It's nine that is being squared to give me 81. And so you follow the formula. You put the 4x squared in the front on both parentheses. You put the nine in the back on both parentheses, and then you give one factor the plus in the middle, and you give one factor the minus in the middle. Now, you'll notice that this factor here actually can be factored again, because that is a difference, minus, of two perfect squares. So that's what I mean by sometimes you'll factor it, but it won't be completely factored because it can factor some more. And so here they noticed, oh, well, two times two is four and x times x is x squared and three times three is nine. And so then they basically put this guy in the front here. They put the three in the back there. And then of course, one of them with the plus sign and one of them with the minus sign. Now your answer can be the same, no matter what order you put these three factors in. You could have had these two factors in the front and the 4x squared plus 9 in the back. There are all kinds of combinations. I'm not about to try to do them all, but as long as what's in the parentheses is exactly the same, it doesn't matter the order of those parentheses, okay? So this whole guy could be in the front, in the back, in the middle. Same goes for this factor and same goes for that factor. Just as long as all three factors are there, you have the correct answer, okay? This one cannot be broken up, okay? When you have the sum, the plus of two perfect squares, there was never a formula for the sum of two perfect squares because that cannot be factored, which is why they did not break that one up like the way they broke up the other one with the minus, okay? So be very aware of that. If you have something that's a square, but with a plus sign in the middle, this thing is considered prime because it cannot be factored at all, okay? Don't ever try to factor something that has two squares and a plus. However, you can do two cubes and a plus, just not two squares and a plus. Okay, let me go down here. So this one was talking about that perfect square stuff. I'm gonna skip through this slide because like I mentioned, I don't necessarily use this formula when it comes to trinomials, I use that AC method. So I'm gonna skip over that slide. If you're curious, you could always download this PDF file like I did and once you get into Cengage. If not, I can email it to everyone just in case, just so you have it. Um, I think, I can't remember. I don't think it's inside the, the orientation module anywhere. So I'll download this and send it to you guys just so that you can have it. Um, if you have a printer, you can print it, but it might not be necessary, okay? Um, so now we're gonna talk about this um, factoring trinomials, okay? And so when we factor trinomials, there's a pattern, okay? Whatever's here in the front, let me turn on my little pin. So whatever's here in the front is what is gonna have to go here and here. And whatever multiplies to give you the back guy is what's gonna have to go here and here. You will figure out what the signs need to be as you go through the process, okay? Now, some people can guess the answer 
and get it correct. And then some people just don't even know where to start when it comes to guessing. Okay. And that's the reason why I choose to teach that one method that works because I am not the kind of person that wants to sit there and be guessing all day and never getting the right answer or be sitting there trying to guess all day. And it turns out the stupid thing can't even be factored. Right. So you don't <laughs> want to waste that time and energy. Um, and if you do the AC method, you will know whether or not it can be factored. Okay. So that's the reason why I try to do it in just one method. So notice that this one, they're trying to factor this trinomial here. And so then they are like, oh, well, I know that 6x times 1, 6x times x is 6x squared. And I know 5 times 1 is 5. Um, but let me try to put them in this order, or let me try to put them in that order. Oh, but I also noticed that 2x times 3x is 6x. Um, so let me try to put them in that order or in this order. You see what I mean, how this can be long? And that's only because five only has one pair to make five and six only has two pairs. What if I put 12 and 24? Those things have a lot of pairs. You're gonna be here forever trying to guess what the answers are. And then throw in a minus sign. <laughs> now you've doubled <laughs> all of the possibilities, okay? So you don't want to be sitting here doing this over and over and over. So I do not suggest guessing unless you're super good at it already and you always get them right. I always tell people, whatever you're doing, if you always get the right answer doing what you're doing, then it's okay. But if sometimes you get the right answer and sometimes you don't, then whatever method you're trying to do doesn't work, okay? So stop doing it. So I have no idea, if, no problem with people doing their own methods that I have not taught just so long as it is a tried and true method that works every single time for every single problem, okay? That's when you know you have an actual method based on true mathematics and not just something that you're like, oh, well, I noticed that this happened in that problem. Let me try it over here. And then it turns out the second one's incorrect, okay? So I've seen people do like a box method. I've seen people do um, some weird stuff and, and it works, which is okay. I'm good if it works. <laughs> um, I just don't like when it doesn't work, okay? Now, I'm not gonna go into factoring trinomials just yet. I don't even care if the factor in the front is just one um, because I wanna get to the AC method and before I can get to the AC method, um, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but we do have to talk about um, factoring by grouping first, because to employ the AC method, I must factor by grouping. And I'll give you the overview of um, the AC method. The AC method is basically a method to break out the middle term here. So whatever that middle term is, it's gonna break it up in a way um, that creates four terms. So then I'll have like minus three X minus four X and then plus two or plus 12, I'm sorry. And then if you factor this four termed expression now, and it's equivalent to this three termed expression because if I were to combine these like terms, I get that negative seven X, right? Um, but if I were to factor the four terms by grouping, I would end up with these two factors, okay? And so that's the hindsight of the AC method. The hard part with the AC method is how do I come up with these two numbers? Why didn't I use negative one and negative six instead, right? There's a reason, I will show that to you when we get to the AC method. But for now, just understand that we do need to know how to factor by grouping in order to factor using the AC method. So how do we do that? Here's what they do. Now I'm gonna write this problem down because again, the way the books like to write things down is a little bit different than the way we actually write things down when we're doing our work on paper. So let me 
stop sharing and let me go to my paper. So here we have this problem here. Um, when you're factoring by grouping, what you're going to do is you're going to group the problem. You've got four, so I can make two even groups by having two terms in one group and two terms in the other group. Now remember that that plus sign belongs to that six. That minus sign belongs to this three. This minus sign belongs to this two. So when I try to cut these in half, you have to make sure that you cut it so that that negative belongs to that three. So essentially I need to put a line right there, okay? And now you've grouped it into two different groups, okay? And then all you're gonna do is factor out the common factor on both sides. So on the left-hand side, I noticed that they both have X's so I can take out x's, but what's the lowest power here? That would be two, so I'm going to take out an x squared, okay? Um, I cannot take out any numbers because if you look at this coefficient and you look at that coefficient, this is a one. One is not gonna get any smaller than one. So I do not, I cannot factor any numbers out of these two things. So remember what I told you, the little cheater way of doing it? That's the lazy way. Whatever you took on the outside, just put it under here and put it under there. And then x cubed divided by x squared is just x to the one. Here, the x squareds cancel and I get minus two. If you're not sure if you did that correctly, distribute this and make sure you get those two terms, okay? For the second half, I'm gonna look at those guys. Between three and six, what number could I divide both of those by? You can type it in the chat or you can come off mute. But what number, go ahead. Three. Yeah, three. And that's the biggest thing I can divide by. However, remember that rule. This is its own problem essentially, right? And if the front term is negative in that problem, I have to, factor out that negative. So I have no choice, but I have to factor out this negative. So notice what is outside my parentheses. It's actually a negative three that is outside my parentheses. So what do I put at the bottom? It's gonna be a negative three. So negative three divided by negative three is a positive and I will still have the X left over. A positive six divided by a negative three is actually negative two. And if I just erase this little red line, you'll notice that that problem looks a lot like the other problem that we saw in the examples when we were factoring out common factors. If you look at this as just two terms, right? Those two terms have something in common. And that's the x minus two that's in parentheses. And so if I were to take this guy and divide it by the x minus two and this guy and divide it by the x minus two, what am I gonna get inside that parentheses? I'm gonna have just the x squared and just the minus three, okay? Now we saw at the very beginning that that could be factored into this. I don't know if you remember, not x squared. I don't know if you remember seeing it, but you do not need to factor these into stuff with square roots, okay? If your answer is gonna require square roots, you can't factor it, don't factor it, okay? That you'll do in calculus later because you have to, but for now, they're not gonna accept that as your answer. For now, if this is not a perfect square, don't keep going, okay? And three is not a perfect square. There's nothing, whether I multiply one times one or two times two, I'm not gonna get three. Notice how it jumps right over three. So three is not a perfect square. So do not try to factor the difference of two perfect squares because you don't have two perfect squares. You have one perfect square and then a non-perfect square. So that's it for this problem, I am done. How do we check? We foil it out, right? So x times x squared is x cubed. 
x times minus three is minus three x. Negative two times x squared is negative two x squared. Negative two times negative three is positive six. Is this expression equivalent to the original? Does anybody know? Yes. It is. These two terms are backwards, right? Over here. But notice that each one of them has still the same sign. So I still have minus three, minus three X, minus two X squared and minus two X squared. So even though the terms are out of order, they are equivalent. And so this is good. That means that this answer is correct. Now let me go back to my shared screen and see if we've got anything, because I know we got some more practicing, more practice coming up. So it says factor out any common factors and then factor according to special polynomials and then all of this factor record. Rate. Okay, so they're basically telling us the order in which we're supposed to factor everything, okay? So the way you factor everything is the first thing you want to look for is the greatest common factor. Can I take out that common factor from all terms first? Okay. Then you want to see if you have the difference of squares or the sum or difference of cubes. If you don't, then go ahead. And for now, they're saying this, but in the future, we're going to do the AC method if it's three terms. If it's four terms, you do grouping, okay? So I don't like the way they structure those guidelines. I'm gonna do my own and then we'll go into these practices, okay? So let me stop the share so I can give you my overview of factoring. So if you have two terms, essentially what you wanna do is uh, factor out the greatest common factor which means you will have something here and then all your terms there, right? Then you're going to use, look for those special uh, forms. And there's only two. There's a squared minus b squared, a cubed minus b cubed, and a cubed plus b cubed. Remember, there's no sum of squares because that cannot be factored. If you have three terms, Okay, then the first one, first step is always going to be to do the GCF. So can you take something out of all three terms? And then the next thing we're going to do is the AC method, which we haven't done just yet. Not yet. Okay. And then the third thing we're going to do is we're going to, um, oh no, after that, you're done. You just apply the whole AC method and then you're done. For four terms, you're gonna always do GCF first. So factor something out of all four, and then you're going to do the grouping. Okay, so that's how it works out. So you have to know how many terms you have to know what you're gonna be doing, okay? And this AC method does require you to group. So you will have more chances than not, you'll be grouping a lot. Okay, so let me um, go back to my shared screen just so that I can, I'll leave this up here actually, and I'll write down the problem um, on my own. So the first problem, actually I'm gonna write it down in case anyone's still writing this down, I'm gonna write down the other page. So practice one is two Z cubed minus four Z squared plus six Z. I don't know why they gave me this problem first because we have not done the AC method. So I'm gonna wait just a minute and then I will keep going.
Okay, it looks like I do need to talk about the AC method because I haven't yet, but I am going to have to. Yep, I am going to have to talk about AC method because I'm looking at these problems and they're getting a little complicated. So I'm gonna use the first one to talk about the AC method. I know we've already gotten down to the practice, but um, I still need to talk about AC method. So I'm gonna use the AC method for this problem here. I'm not gonna do the practice just yet. So I want to talk about the AC method and I'm going to have to come up with a problem on my own real quick. So give me one moment. Got to scribble something over here. Okay, so I'm gonna take this problem, 6x squared um, plus 2x minus six. Right? Yeah. Oh no, there should be a five. My bad. Okay, good. Now, this one does not have a GCF, right? That five throws it all off. So I've got, and this guy doesn't have an X. So I can't take out a number that they have in common. And I can't take out a variable that they have in common. So there is no GCF here. And it is a trinomial, which means I do need to apply this AC method, okay? So here's the big thing. You have to recognize that this first term is your A, this last term is your C, and the term in the middle is your B, okay? The whole thing is your B. So everything is spoken for, signs and all, okay? What you wanna do is you wanna find something that multiplies to give you this AC multiplied together, but at the same time adds to give you that middle guy B. That's the game plan. Once you figure out what these two things are, that's how you break up the middle guy. And then you have four terms now, and then you just do the grouping. Okay. But how do we find these? I call them magic numbers. But how do we find this perfect pair that works so that everything will play out well in the grouping? Right. So for my problem, this means. 6x squared times negative 6 is actually negative 36x squared. And then b itself is a positive 5x, OK? And so I need these numbers that multiply to give me negative 36x squared, but add to give me 5, OK? Now, there's a whole lot that's going on in this process. So I'm going to walk you through step by step real quick. No, well, not real quick, but <laughs> I'm going to walk you through step by step. So the list of factors, and factors are things that multiply, okay? The list of factors is shorter than the list of sums because anything can add together to give me positive five. I could take negative um, 995 and add 1000. And what does that equal? That equals five, right? But I know for sure that if I multiply these two things together, I'm not going to get 36, right? But there's a whole bunch of things that can add that give you positive five. So you don't want to focus on the list of stuff that adds to give you the middle guy because you'll be there forever, okay? What you want to focus on is how to get that 36. Okay, and so this is what I do is I take the 36 and I make like a little tree. Okay, 
And I want to list all the factors. And so I want to know, was does one times something equal 36, two times something, four times something, five times something, right? How far down do I have to go? That's the first question. How do I know how far down that list I've got to go? Here's the answer. You're going to take the square root of this number and whatever that is, if it's a decimal, like let's say it was the square root, let's say the number was 37, um, it's gonna be six point something. You don't care about this part, you only care about the whole number, okay? Here it happened to be a nice number like six. So I'm gonna take that number six, right? But in case it's not a nice perfect square, you just take the whole number, don't worry about the decimals. But this is the number that you will go to on your list. So I know I do not need to go down beyond six, okay? These are all gonna be my pairs. So then I start trying to figure out, well, one times what will give me 36? You can use your calculator to figure that out. You can do 36 divided by one to figure it out, 36 divided by two to figure out the next one, 36 divided by three. This is in case you're not great at your multiplication tables, you don't remember all of these things, um, then you have something to revert to, okay? Notice that that one's a decimal, okay? I can't put decimals in here. So five is not going to be a factor. 36 divided by, oops, divided by six is six. So this is how you'll know whether you have all the factors. Do the square root, make your list all the way to that number, find all the pairs that go with it. And I promise you, this is the entire list. So if none of these numbers work, then this thing is prime, okay? And that's what's nice about this method, that I know that if I do this list and none of them work, then my answer is prime. And I know that for sure, okay? Rather than trying to guess if it's prime or not, or get tired of trying to guess the answer and then just call it prime. And it turns out you just didn't guess correctly and there was a magic, way to factor it, right? Um, there was a certain pair that was supposed to work. So for me, I know all of these multiply to give me 36. Fantastic. But I need to figure out which one of those will add to give me five. Now remember, these numbers have to multiply to give me a negative 36, which means either all of these guys are negative or all of these guys are negative. I have to use the bottom guy's sign to figure out which column is going to be negative, okay? Whatever the answer is here, remember you're adding two things together and you're supposed to end up with a plus, which means whatever these numbers are, the bigger number is going to be plus, okay? So that tells me that all of these bigger numbers in this column are going to be pluses which means all of the smaller numbers are gonna have to be negative. So you do have to logically think about it a little bit. There's no just like, it's gonna be this, okay? You've gotta think about those signs. It has to multiply to be negative, which means somebody's gonna be negative, but the bigger one has to be positive. So that means the smaller ones have to be negative. And so then figure it out. Is negative one plus 36 gonna give me positive five? Nope. Is negative two plus 18 going to give me positive five? Nope. Is negative three plus 12 going to give me negative five? Nope. It's gonna give me positive, or give me positive five. Negative three plus 12 would give me positive nine. However, negative four, plus nine does give me positive five. So those are the numbers that I need to put here. Negative four and positive nine. But remember the letters have to match also. So you can only add these numbers together if they are like terms. And since this has an X, it means both of these should have an X. And sure enough, these gotta match and these gotta match. So negative 4x times 9x, is that negative 36x squared? It is. 
is negative 4x plus 9x positive 5? It is. So these are the two numbers that I'm going to need to break up that positive 5. So that's a whole process, right? But it works every single time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this positive 5 and I'm going to break it up into negative 4x and positive 9x using this right here because it's equivalent to positive 5x. And again, sometimes it takes me 30 minutes, sometimes it takes me an hour, however long it takes for um, the video to process and, and upload into Zoom. Um, as soon as it comes in there, I post the videos. So if you need to watch this process again before you start trying to do your um, homework, once the homework starts working, um, you can come back to this part in the video and, and watch this play out again, okay? So you will have it as a reference. So now I've got four terms, so I've got to do grouping. Okay, anybody want to come off of mute and tell me what everything that I could factor from these two terms? So what is the, the big common factor there? 2x. Yes. 2 for the number, x for the variables. So then if I divide that by 2x, I get 3x. If I divide this by 2x, I get 2. Okay, you have to use this sign, whatever it is, you have to. What can I factor from these two guys? Anybody know? Three. Mm -hmm. Three. So when I divide this guy by a positive three, I get positive three X. When I divide negative six by a positive three, I get negative two. They have the three X minus two in common. And if I were to factor that out, I'd be left with the 2x plus 3, OK? And so this is the factorization for that problem that we were given at the beginning. If you don't believe it or you just want to be for sure that you did it correctly, you can FOIL this. So 3x times that is going to be 6x squared. 3x times this is going to be positive 9x. Negative two times two X is gonna be negative four X. And then negative two times positive three is gonna be negative six. And if I combine these like terms in the middle, I do get that positive five that they have in the middle up there. So it is correct, okay? So that's the whole AC method played out, okay? We're going to apply this method to our practice problems. Okay, so you're going to see the process over and over with different numbers and different variables. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead <laughs> and jot down that first practice problem so that we can work on it. And I'm actually going to go to another page because I'm, I'm going to need to use AC method, so I might need a little bit more space than this. Now there is quite a few problems to practice in this section. So we'll go as far as we can go until the time runs out. Hopefully we can get to all of them. I do not know. Whatever we don't get to today, um, we will finish tomorrow, okay? And then we'll go into that last uh, section from chapter one in this unit. So we have, I think, 10 practice problems. So I'm not gonna try to rush through them. We're just gonna go through them. And like I said, whatever we don't finish today, we will finish tomorrow, okay? But we have learned or we have been refreshed depending on where you are um, about a lot of this factoring stuff, okay? And it really does take practice. So, um, my boyfriend not too long ago was taking an intermediate algebra class and the way we practice was literally i mean it's you could use flashcards if you don't have someone that already knows the math you could use flashcards but i would do from like one from one all the way to 196 all the way to 196 because i promise you those numbers come up a lot um, but from one all the way to 196, start practicing 
all the factors of one through 196. And if you don't wanna do that, then you're going to have to rely on your calculator a lot to figure this out, okay? Because eventually what you wanna do is you wanna be able to look at this, know what the common factor is, look at it, know what to do for AC method, and then just do it, okay? You don't wanna spend as much time breaking everything down as we just did in the example, okay? But again, it takes practice. The more and more you see these things, the more common they start coming up. And then the more and more you just kind of basically remember what the answers were. So for this one, do I have a common factor that I can take from all three? AC method will not be used in all 10 problems. AC method is only used for trinomials. Okay, remember that little chart that we had over here? AC method is only there when there's three terms. If it's two terms, we're supposed to be using one of those special formulas. And if it's four terms, we're supposed to be grouping right off the bat. Of course, after you try to take a GCF. Always try to take a GCF first. Okay, but that is a good question. We don't use AC method for everything, okay? Just the trinomials, three terms. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so this one, we do have something in common, actually. Anybody want to come off of mute and tell me what we have in common for all three? 2Z. Mm -hmm. So then 2Z comes out, and then I can do this part of my brain, right? What happens if I factor? divide this by 2z. What do I get? z squared. Mm -hmm. Then the, a negative divided by a positive is still negative. So here I get 2, but I still need another z to make z squared, right? A positive and a positive will give me positive, but then this would be 3 with no z, because this times this will give me the z. Right? If you ever are not sure that you factored out your GCF correctly, just distribute. And if it comes out to the original, you did factor the common factor correctly. However, notice I have three terms in there, don't I? Okay. So I have to factor this guy using the AC method. And so at the very end, what I want is I want my answer to be 2z and then whatever I get when I'm done factoring, okay? That will be the answer, the final, final answer. But how do I factor that trinomial? That's where we're going to come to the side and we're going to apply our AC method, okay? So A times C is gonna be a positive three Z squared. And then I'm gonna to add to get B, which is negative two Z. Remember, take the factors of this number. Do not try to think of the numbers that add to give you negative two. There's an infinite number of possibilities for that bottom equation. We cannot be here forever. <laughs> so take the factors of three. There is only one factor of three. It's one and three, that's the only option you got, okay? And if you took the square root of three, you'll notice it's one point something something. So I knew to stop my list at one anyway, okay? Now, however, it's a positive three, isn't it? Okay, which means that these both either have to be both plus or both minus. And because this is a negative two, that tells me that I am gonna have to have negatives. So these should both be negative, but here's the problem. Is negative one plus negative three equal to negative two? No. No, it's not, right? It's equal to negative four. So these numbers, even though I did everything correctly, I got the list of numbers correctly. I put the signs according to these signs correctly, but it still doesn't work, okay? What that means is it means that this guy 
is prime. Okay, which means it cannot be factored. So my answer will not look like this because I couldn't factor it. Okay, and so that means my answer is just the 2z with the trinomial that I had before because I cannot factor that trinomial anymore. I followed that AC method to the T and it still did not help me factor it. So that guy cannot be factored, okay? So you do have to apply the AC method, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work, right? Okay, let me get to the second example and see what that one looks like. So example two or practice two looks like this. Okay, so do these, does this expression have a GCF? This one's a little complicated actually. Does this one have a GCF? No. It does. Does anybody know what it is? Is it just one? Uh -uh. Here's where your eyes need to see. Your eyes need to see this as one giant plus sign in the middle. And so you have two terms. You have this term and you have this term. If I group it, if I make it obvious like that, do you see that they have anything in common? It wouldn't be three, would it? They do have X a five. And they have an X minus five. So you have two things in common. You're right. The three X and the six have a three in common but the X minus five is also in common. So this one was tricky because it had not just the parentheses in common, like some of the examples we'd already seen, but now it also has a three in common. So this one's gonna be really tricky on coming up with what goes inside the parentheses. Because remember, you gotta divide by the X minus fives, which will just cancel, but then you also have gotta divide these guys by three. And so in the parentheses, I'll just end up with an X and a plus two. And you can check these. If you're not sure if they are equivalent, you can um, check. If I were to distribute this three X, I'd get three X squared minus 15 X. If I distribute this positive six, I get positive six X and negative 30. If I take this and I multiply it out, remember the, pro the process of multiplying. You have to multiply two of them together and then multiply the third one last. So I always go this way just because um, it's easier to distribute that guy later. So this gives me x squared, positive 2x, minus 5x, and positive, nope, negative 10. And then what happens when I distribute this three, we get three X squared plus six X minus 15 X minus 30. These guys are the same. They're not in the same order, but they are equivalent. I've got positive three X squared here and here, positive six X there and there, negative 15 X here and here, and negative 30 here and here. Okay, so they are equivalent which means that this is the correct factorization. And I don't have any squares or cubes, so I don't need to worry about trying to factor that more, okay? You only have to keep going if it's a trinomial in here or in here, or if it's squares or cubes in there. And since there's none, we're done. So that one was tricky because it had a lot of stuff in common, even though it doesn't look like it when you just first glance at it. So that one was very interesting. 
Okay, let's look at number three. So if you're great at your times tables, you might see this. You might already see what they have in common. If you're not great at your times tables, you might have to sit there on your calculator and divide 63 by a bunch of different numbers and divide 28 by a bunch of different numbers and see if there's one number that divides evenly into both of them. Does anybody know by looking at those what number it is? Seven. Mm -hmm. So if I go on my calculator and I type 63 divided by seven, it goes in evenly, it goes in nine times. And then if I take 28 divided by seven, that one also goes in evenly and it's four. But this doesn't have any variables, so I can't take out any variables. So all I can take out is that seven. And then this divided by seven I know now is nine. This divided by seven I know now is four. Now, this is a binomial, right? Two terms. So all I have to do is see if it follows one of those formulas. It's definitely not cubed, right? This guy right there shows me that it's not cubes, it's squares. And if you see squares, if this is a plus sign, you're done because you know that squares and a plus sign don't factor. But if you see a square and a minus sign, this does factor so long as both of these are perfect squares. And in this particular problem, both of them are perfect squares, okay? So what is it that's being squared? Here, it's a three that's being squared. This one's harder. Does anybody know what is being squared to get 4x squared? What times itself will give me 4x squared? Two. For the number, yes. What about for the variables? Two X. Yeah, you got it. Okay, because when I take two X times two X, right? I will get the four X squared. Okay, so then the formula told me that once I figure out what it is that's being squared here, it's just a matter of putting the front guy in the front of the parentheses and putting the back guy in the back of the parentheses and then writing one with the plus and one with the minus. Whether you choose to put the plus here or you choose to put the plus there, it doesn't make a difference. Just one needs to have a plus and one needs to have a minus. So then you look again, I have binomials, right? Do they have squares or cubes? No, so that one's good. Does this one have squares or cubes? No, so that one's good. And so this is the final answer there. We have about, um, about 11 minutes left. So I might go through one more, but then I will table the other um, six for next class period. Plus it'll give you some time to kind of absorb all the stuff we've been talking about so far. Um, so that maybe, you know, it'll make sense still tomorrow, okay? And we won't forget everything because sometimes, to be honest, that does happen. Okay, so this is number four. That's what it looks like, a huge number. I'm gonna have to use my calculator because that's a huge number and that's not normally one of the ones I just remember, okay? So I do see that it's a binomial. You've got two terms only. You've got this huge first term, and then one is your second term, okay? And I do see that there's a minus sign, and then I've gotta decide, is this cubes or squares, okay? The easiest way to decide whether it's cubes or squares is to look at the exponents on the variables. If the exponents can be divided by three, then they're cubes. If the exponents can be divided by two, then they're squares. And four exponent actually can be divided by two, not three. 
So this is a difference of squares, which means I will be using um, that formula that we just talked out. Again, it doesn't matter which one's plus and which one's minus. So that means I need to figure out well, what the heck is being squared over here, because I know it's going to be big. And then what is being squared over here? The one is easy. The only thing that will give you one is one. So one squared gives me one. That 2401, I have no idea. I'm going to try. I know 10 times 10 is 100, so it's got to be a lot bigger than 100. Um, 20 times 20 is 400. Let's see, 50 times 50. OK, so it's got to be real close to 50, right? Let's see, 49 times 49. Ah, it's 49 times 49. So then this is going to be 49. And then here's the thing. What is the power for you so that I would get you to the fourth? Anybody want to try? Can you repeat that? What power or exponent would I put on my variable u so that when I square it, I get u to the fourth? Wouldn't you put two? Yes. It's two times two would give me the four. Yes, good. Okay, great. I figured out what is being squared. Now it's just a matter of putting those things in the front and the back and then one with the plus and one with the minus. So this will actually turn into um, 49 u squared in the front and then one and one in the backs and then one with the plus and one with the minus. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. Okay, I have two terms and two terms. So I have to look and make sure that none of them have squares or cubes. Unfortunately, they both have squares. So I have to analyze them. They could possibly factor more. However, we know that if we have squares and a plus, this guy's not going to factor anymore. But if we have squares and a minus, it will factor more. So we do need to figure out how to factor that second one more. OK. And because it's a difference of squares, we have to figure out what is it that's being squared. So what's being squared here and what is being squared there? Anybody know what is going to go in that first parentheses? Seven. Almost seven. How am I going to get the letters? Seven U. Yeah, you got it. Seven U. And then back here. Never has to be the same person that replies. And it could be more than one person that replies at the same time. I'm all good. Wouldn't it just be one again? Mm -hmm. You got it. So then now I know seven U. Oops, I don't want to use red. 7u would go in the front here and the front there. One would go in the back there and there. And one would have a plus and one would have a minus. We know this one cannot be factored, but I don't have any squares or cubes here. And I don't have any squares or cubes there, which means I am finally done with this problem. And so that's my final answer. Now, if you wanted, we have about six minutes. I could check the answer. But if you wanted, I would multiply these two together. And then that result, multiply it with this and see if you get the original. So I'm going to actually do it because we do have a few minutes. So I'm going to keep this one. This is my check. This is not part of the actual problem. So if you're taking a test and you stop there and you don't check it, I'm OK with that. Just letting you know you can check it if you want to. So 7u times 7u is 49u squared. 7u times negative 1 is negative 7u. Positive 1 times positive 7u is positive 7u. And positive 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. If I combine those like terms in that second parentheses, 
these two guys actually make all the U's go away. I owed somebody seven U's. I gave them seven U's. Now there's no more U's, okay? Which takes me back to that step, right? So, so far so good, but we still wanna make sure that that step was good as well. So then I'm gonna do 49 U squared times 49 U squared, which is 2401 U to the fourth. 49 U squared times negative one is negative 49 U squared. Now we distribute the positive one. So positive one times positive 49 U squared is positive 49 U squared. Positive one times negative one is negative one. And the same thing happens again. These two guys, I owed somebody 49 U squareds. I gave them 49 U squareds. Now I have no more 49 U squareds, right? So they're gone. I just have this term and this term. And that is exactly what we had, what we started with, okay? So we do check out, we do have the right answer. Does anybody have any questions so far? It could be with what we talked about mathematically today. It could have to do with the class in general or anything else. But does anybody have any questions? For like our answer, well, not the one that you have boxed and it has seven U plus one and seven U minus one. It has those two like um um like I guess I don't know how to say it, but like in parentheses because the negative one has a two exponent. Mm, this one because of this up here. Wait, what? What are I'm not sure. I'm not understanding your question. I'm okay. sorry. Like you see where it says 49 u um squared, and then you have the other squared, so it can equal four and minus and it's a one and another square. And it's written in At red. The, in the first line with the red? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And then the answer that's boxed. Uh-huh. After like the 49u squared plus one, it's like 7u plus one. Like you see the two, like and they're both in parentheses. In the second red line. No, in the box. Like it's boxed. Yes, because that was one of the factors that we used the first time we applied the formula. So okay. um, when I applied the formula that's over there in green at the top right. Mm -hmm. I had to take what was in the first red parentheses. Can you see my mouse or no? No. You cannot see my mouse? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me... I know when I share my screen, it pops up, but let me just use my pen. So let me grab this other color. So when I found out what was being squared here and here, I just applied this formula. So I took this thing and put it in the fronts and then took this thing and put it in the backs. And then because the formula has one with the plus and one with the minus, I put one with the plus and one with the minus. I did it in the opposite order, but it doesn't matter the order, okay? And then here, we know that when we have squares and a plus, this cannot factor anymore, which means that is a factor to this. It just can't break out anymore like that one broke out into two, this one cannot break out into two. So that factor still has to be part of my answer, okay? Because if I don't put that as part of my answer, what happens when I just multiply those? I only get this, right? I wouldn't get the 2401 u to the fourth power. So my answer could not be just those two guys by themselves. I have to include that first original factor, okay? But then we notice that this factor from when we applied this formula the first time, um, this one has a square and a minus sign, which means that one can use this formula again, okay? And then that was why we did this in the red to break out this one. So this one broke out into two more factors. This one could not break out into two more factors. And that's because it has the plus sign? Right, exactly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, I'm going to hit stop record.